It is my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker to you, uh, Professor Janet Kolodner. Uh, having said this, uh, uh, into introducing Janet to an audience like you might be seen uh, as, uh, as necessary as carrying water views to Sydney. Uh, but for the uh, uh, information, maybe the younger one, the new researchers amongst you, let me let me uh, uh, do that anyway, in particular because it is a great pleasure. I want to start uh, just uh, reading the first sentences from her uh, web bio. Professor Kalona is Regents Professor at the School of Interactive Computing at the Georgia Institute of Technology. She was founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of the Learning Sciences and a founder of the International Society for the Learning Sciences. And she served, she served as society's first executive officer. At present, she works at the National Science Foundation, where she is lead program officer for a funding program called Cyber Learning, Transforming Education. Uh, what I want to do is unpack, uh, if you uh, allow me to do that for a couple of minutes, uh, uh, Janet's uh, career. Um, I was able to identify in her career up to now uh, three stages and one central theme. The three stages are really uh, paradigmatic, not only for her personal career, but maybe for the, of the learning sciences um, uh, itself. And the first stage was uh, work in the lab. Uh, Janet, together with uh, uh, colleagues uh, such as Roger Schenk in, in Yale, pioneered, uh, as some of you may remember, uh, case-based reasoning. And she also wrote what I consider, and not only me, the ultimate book on the subject in 1993, called Appropriately Case-Based Reasoning. On a personal note, uh, this book changed um, what I, and I was working at that stage in Pittsburgh uh, at the Learning Research and Development Center, it changed um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a serious way how I was thinking about cognition and cognitive architectures. Because in Pittsburgh, of course, in the 70s, 80s, we were thinking, when we th saw problem solving, we were thinking problem spaces, problem solving operators, search, means ends analysis. And there were these people in Yale who had pretty much different ideas about how people go about solving problems. And um, on, um, on, on close inspection, those ideas were um, uh, not at all uninteresting. <laughs> also, I dare say, uh, uh, Janet's book at this stage uh, made me almost become interested in cooking. <laughs> uh, something nobody has achieved since then. And speaking of cooking, uh, for those who know Janet, that's of course her, her big theme. That's the central theme. Uh, to understand why and how, uh, I offer the first piece of evidence uh, and look into her book that I just showed you. You find in there um, uh, described a, uh, uh, an, an, an architecture for a case-based reasoning system. Uh, at that stage, and probably even today, a state-of-the-art case-based reasoning system. But what does it compute? Well, it computes uh, dinner plans. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe similar, uh, similar things. But, um, and um, uh, appropriately, this system is called Chef, that, uh, uh, spend, uh, that um, uh, she spends quite some time on uh, explaining in, in, in her book. But let's move on to the stages. Uh, the second stage, as any uh, learning scientist, learning science uh, researcher should do, is uh, not only work in the lab, but also go out into the field. And um, uh, Janet's uh, uh, approach is, is grounded in, in her foundational work on learning by design pedagogy, which she then uh, used as a foundation for developing a very substantial uh, science curriculum. Uh, called uh, Project-Based Inquiry Science. And again, if you uh, dig into uh, this curriculum, uh, as for instance represented websites, you find the theme uh, coming back. Uh, the Kitchen Science Investigator is maybe not the first uh, 
uh, approach to combining science education with uh, food and, and cooking um, uh, as, a, as activity. But it's certainly uh, the most elaborated and the most extensive and, and, and rigorous one. Um, I guess she's now, it's not fair to say that she's at the third stage. Uh, and again, learning science is, as a field tries to perhaps follow her. Working in policy, at least at a research policy level, I mentioned already her role as uh, lead program officer in, for the cyber learning uh, initiative. Um, and now, if my theory is right, uh, her, big theme, her big theme will in the one or other way uh, show up on this stage as well. So you shouldn't be too surprised if you know, what some of the research uh, NSF will be funding in the future may look like <laughs> this. At this stage, this is only a rumor. So don't write your proposals just yet. I want to end my uh, introduction to uh, Janet and her work in preparation of her uh, keynote by a, a bit more serious uh, note. Um, I, um, uh, arguably, the, the, the biggest contribution that she made to the field uh, and to this research community is, is and was in her role in her uh, as, as foundation editor and as, as long-term editor in chief of the Journal of the Learning Sciences. Um, the, her first editorial for the first volume, first issue uh, in 1991 of uh, that journal, I, uh, I have the first paragraphs here. When I was reading this again in preparation of this uh, introduction, I was, uh, I was amazed how, um, how the programmatic goals that she set out in that editorial, uh, how, how, how recent and modern they they still sound now, 20, more than 20 years later, uh, to allow cognitive sciences to have an impact on the practice of education as the core mission of the journal, to help develop models of learning in real-world situations, uh, be a multidisciplinary uh, uh, forum, publish analysis uh, taking place at multiple levels with multiple methods, be relevant for and read by multiple audiences, including uh, practitioners and, and policy makers. We probably wouldn't hesitate to underwrite those programmatic goals uh, today as we did um, uh, 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 some 20, 20 years ago. And while the, this editorial, um, in this editorial, impact was sought on education in America, Janet has also been instrumental in making the learning sciences a worldwide area of educational research. And the journal, as well as this conference, catering to a truly international uh, community. And uh, I think the numbers that Michael just mentioned uh, uh, speak, speak to that. Uh, so it's only logical that she's now here over down under in Australia and will open this uh, 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 conference with her keynote. So please uh, join me in welcoming Janet and asking you to so much. I'm a little bit embarrassed. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, Peter was one of the first people to actually use my PhD work to try to explain something that I wasn't doing in my PhD work. It was really very exciting when he got in touch with me. Um, it must have been sometime at the beginning of, the inter of use of the internet, Peter. I I'm not sure. I mean, it was in the 80s. It was not as late as 93. It was, it was I think, the early to mid 80s and um, and it was kind of neat. Um, I also want to thank Peter for uh, beginning my talk with for me with uh, what was going on in the learning sciences um, it, when we started the journal so that that will be nice that uh, that was already said. So what I want to do today what I want to do today is to talk about changing the world, learning scientists changing the world, challenges and opportunities. So it was something that I, uh, you know, wrote about us having the possibility of doing 20 years ago. And um, I'm not so sure we've done as good a job of that as we could, or maybe it just takes more time than, um, you know, than I think. When I was younger, I used to always point out when I thought that something was 
um, you know, taking too long. I used to say, well, you know, I'm young and young people are, are overly optimistic. But, you know, I'm not so young anymore and I'm still overly optimistic. Um, so what I, what I want to do, okay, is I want to talk about some of those challenges and opportunities for changing the world and um, what our MO, our modus operandi as a uh, community might need to be to make that happen. A little bit different than it's been in the past. So uh, let me see, the history's pretty much already been given, so I won't spend too much time on this. Um, uh, in the late 1980s, there were people in education, people in educational psychology, people in artificial intelligence, people in cognitive science, people in sociology, people in, uh, in anthropology, who were kind of unhappy with what was happening in their fields. Um, they were just all too narrow to really address the real problems that were, or to really, I shouldn't say to address the real problems in education. I think the education and educational technology people were saying that. Um, I think the artificial intelligence and cognitive science people were saying that their fields were too narrow to really, at, at the time, the methods were too narrow to really understand learning in the real world. Everything was kind of idealized too much. And um, I had been saying that, some of my colleagues had been saying that. I walked into Alan Collins' office while I was on sabbatical in 1988. And I said, 1987, 88, and I said to him, you know, we really need a new journal. Uh, we really, you know, cognitive science is getting stale. And he said, I said to him, you know, you have to start a new journal. And he said to me, no. He said, you have to start a new journal. Um, it's your generation now. We already did it. And um, several months later, maybe it was a year later, I don't know, Roger Shank came up to me and he said, um, well, Alan Collins and, um, and Don Norman and I, and no, it wasn't Don Norman, somebody else, Andrew Ortoni and I, have been talking about the need for a new journal and we want you to um, found it um, along with two more people. We'll figure out who those will be. And I said, well, um, Okay, I'll do that. I had, of course, already been talking to Alan Collins about it. I said, I'll do that, but the other two people have to be as conscientious as I am. And uh, he came back to me a couple weeks later and he said, you're starting the journal. Um, he said, uh, you know, talk to, um, what was her name? Hollis Heimbach, I think was her name. Hollis somebody at uh, Journal of the Learning Sciences and uh, Larry, I I'm sorry, at Earl Larry Erlbaum um, Associates. And, uh, and Larry Erlbaum will tell you how to do it. He knows everything. So uh, in 1989, right around Thanksgiving, I made a trip to, um, where was it? They weren't in Mawa, New Jersey, then they were someplace else in New Jersey. I can't remember. Hillsdale, New Jersey. And I talked to Larry Erlbaum. And um, he told me everything I needed to know about running a journal. I mean, he told me that um, you need to always have reviewers because they're your ammunition, and then nobody can be personally angry at you. And uh, that's been some, that's been, you know, that's something we do at the National Science Foundation too. So there are not too many people around who are personally angry at me. But in any case, um, the journal got started at that time. And in that first issue, I wrote what Peter reported I wrote, okay, that I hoped that we would be influencing education and using the journal as a vehicle for discussions with educational professor, professionals, teachers and administrators. Um, we didn't know it was going to be an education journal, but it turned into an education journal. And, um, you know, the goals have become or became both to learn about learning in real world settings and have an effect on education. And, of course, with a strong belief that creative use of technology could provide some of the answers. Not all of the answers, some of the answers. Um, so when I look back on where we are today, um, I think there's a lot more now that we know about learning, promoting learning, and promoting learning with technology. I have some of my favorites, and I'm going to say a little bit about my favorite foundations. Um, we know a lot of ways that technology can provide opportunities for learning that are not available otherwise, and I'm not going to 
I, my talk's going to be kind of boring, okay? I'm not going to I'm not going to show you any pictures or any videos and I'm not going to say too much about exactly what I think those technologies are. I'm sorry. Okay, I've got other things I'm going to say. Um, we've designed some really appealing software based on what we know about how people learn. Okay, my all-time favorite continues to be um, 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 Genscope. Okay, but we've done a lot of other things since then too. Okay, and we've published curricula and curriculum units. You know, I've published, published. Uh, you know, I've been part of doing that. Um, we've published lots of resources for helping teachers or, uh, promote engagement, helping learning happen better in classrooms. And we're continuing on that trajectory, okay? And the software and the curriculum units are getting more and more exciting. Okay, there's some things we don't know, but uh, there's a lot we know that could have an influence. But we haven't changed the world enough from my point of view. Okay, so we have people on the national and international committees. I'm looking at some of those people. If there's one there and there's one there. Okay, there are other, there, I don't know where some of the other people are. Okay, um, we have had little rollouts of technology. Um, in fact, we've had big rollouts of some technology. Scratch is used by hundreds of thousands of kids. Um, but I don't think we've fundamentally changed a lot. School is still looks like school, and when you talk to people out there about what they think about how to do things, it still always looks like this room with um, a teacher in front of the class talking. I mean, even this new thing you know that's happening from Stanford and MIT and Harvard, um, what are they called, MOOCs? I don't even know what it stands for. But, um, you know, where you've got these great lecturers giving great lectures about all kinds of things and making them available, it's great lectures. I mean, they don't focus on how people learn. Okay, so um, I think we've made little progress in helping people have imagination. Uh, people outside of us have imagination. Um, not enough progress in rolling out products and even less progress on evaluating to show what works. And uh, we have so much to offer. So what I want to do in this talk is talk about what we have to offer and how we might move towards being able to offer those things. So I'll talk about the future of learning environments, what we want to see going on in those learning environments. Uh, based on what we know about promoting learning in ways that engage everyone. Um, I'm standing up here freezing, so I'm starting to shake and my voice is starting to shake. It's very cold up here. Um, we're gonna, I might, have to, I might start walking around just to, to get warm. <laughs> um, I'm gonna talk about the future of learning technologies, but I already said I'm gonna be boring about that. I'm not gonna talk a lot about exactly what's out there. Um, and, um, and then I'm going to talk about what we need to do as a community in order to have influence. And I know there was all kinds of political stuff and policy stuff that's in our way, and, um, but beyond that, there are things we can do. And I need you to remember, this is me talking, okay? I might be at NSF now, okay? But you notice in the first slide that it said Georgia Institute of Technology and not the National Science Foundation. And um, in this slide, it says, this is Kaladner talking, not the NSF. I did not run this by anybody at NSF. And there's no NSF policy I'm talking about. Um, it's true I'm giving out money these days, okay? And it's true that I have biases, and you will learn my biases. And yes, you will want to put them into your proposals that you send to cyber learning. <laughs> but I'm not talking for NSF. Okay, so all the good things I say and all the bad things I say, none of it's coming from NSF, it's just coming from me. Okay, so here we go. Imagine the future of learning environments. Okay, there are a lot of people who talk about school going away and burning down schools, and school's not going to happen in the future. And you know what? As long as people need to make a living, their children are going to have to go to school. Okay, there's just no way about around that. There's going to be school. It doesn't have to look the way it looks today. Okay, it's, do, it's not the only place where children learn. 
Um, children, teens, and young adults are not the only people who have learning needs. So learning sciences, the future of learning environments, is not simply about children and school. Okay, and authority figures don't have any monopoly on the ability to facilitate and promote learning. So we're not simply talking about teachers when we talk about those people who help people learn. Okay, and uh, the computer's gonna be part of it, a big part of it, but it's not gonna, you know, there are people out there who think the computer's gonna take over. The computer's not going to. And all these people talk about any time, anywhere. I just saw something that, um, that Chris Didi wrote where he said, you know, it's really easy for any time, anywhere to become no time, nowhere. I mean, we know that, right? So, um, so just let's do a little bit of imagining. I have a feeling this imagining is a little bit boring, what I'm gonna say, but we'll do a little bit of imagining just to remember that schools, just to remember these three things. School's not the only place children can learn. Um, everybody learns, not just children. And authority figures don't have any monopoly on helping people learn, promoting learning. So, you know, there are all these traditional things that are not school, right? The class visits the science center or the aquarium together to collect data for addressing some ecosystem problem. Okay, that's school and outside of school interacting with each other to do something at school, okay? Um, you have parents and kids going together to a maker space. They build a robot that changes direction when the light is shined at it. Or they build something more way more sophisticated than that. There's parents and kids learning together. Well, they, they're building something. They may or may not be learning together, but they have the opportunities to learn together there. Um, you know, in rural, commu rural communities, you have very traditionally have, it's a father and the boy children, okay? But you can think about parents and kids repairing a car or a tractor together, okay? It's real traditional learning, okay, where people learn. Um, bringing the food into it, okay? Parents and kids perfect recipes together in the kitchen. Okay, one of my, you know, my fondest memories of my mother, okay, are, have to do with perfecting recipes together. Okay, when my father was just visiting, I made the, my mother's kugel that we had perfected together, and my father was really excited about it. Okay, there's all kinds, there's all kinds of learning that can happen when those things are going on. Kids play games together, communities of gamers and hobbyists achieve goals together. Okay, that's all places where learning is happening. Okay, and it's not only kids who need to learn. Okay, so new parents need to learn parenting skills or how to help the kids learn or something like that. New employees need to learn the practices of a shop. Um, in one, of the, uh, in one of the projects I'm funding, families are learning together about energy and energy use and making good decisions about energy use. Okay, um, I don't know what, how buying a car got in there. But um, you know, families may learn together about those things and may need to learn together about those things. Um, in one of the by projects, um, in fact, it was one Peter talked about, uh, middle school girls learn to cook together and in the process learn about heat transfer and chemical reactions and experiment design and um, uh, fishermen on the coast, anybody's coast, okay, wonder how to manage their fleets given changing climate conditions. They've got to learn some new things to be able to do that. Okay, vintners, I went on, I went on a wine tour the other day. Vintners managing the grape growing in their vineyards, vintners managing grape growing in their vineyards need to consider all the different things that are happening in different parts of their fields. The soil is different in different parts of their fields. And there's learning they have to do to get the growing right and to get the uh, the winemaking right, okay, after they grow. So it's not only kids who need to learn. And authority figures have no monopoly on facilitating learning. So college students or young professionals can work with those middle school girls to help them learn to cook, right? Older kids help 
can help younger kids to learn to program apps. World of Warcraft players of all ages give each other advice about strategy and play. Okay, um, my favorite example of people of all ages learning together is the Mummers Clubs in Philadelphia. I grew up in Philadelphia. There's a Mummers Parade every um, uh, New Year's Day. And they're making music and wearing all kinds of wonderful costumes. It's sort of like M Mardi Gras. Um, all kinds of wonderful costumes. And, um, and making floats. And it's people, communities, working together, people of all different ages, working together and helping each other learn. OK? So all right, so that was, you know, my examples of the future of learning environments. You know, school's not the only place children learn. Children, teens, and young adults are not the only people of learning needs. Authority figures don't have a monopoly on the ability to facilitate and promote learning. But in fact, I think that none of what I said took all that much imagination. So the question is, what's new in what we need to be doing? And I think what's new is that the, it's the 21st century. OK, so in the 21st century, um, I hate saying this, but the world is flat, OK? Um, we've got a global, you know, global economy. Individual economies almost don't exist anymore. And um, everybody needs to learn the things that are needed to participate fully in the workforce, fully in citizenry, because we're past factory jobs now for the most part. People need to do much more thinking in their jobs. Um, everybody in the 21st century needs a spirit of learning, the disposition to learn. They need to want to learn. Because they say from now on, nobody will have just one job or career in a lifetime. OK? Um, because the tools that we're using change fast. OK? And those things require everyone, you know, not just the people on top, to be capable of developing new, school, new skills and capabilities. And then we have all these issues as, as societies. Um, we've got non-renewable resources that we need to worry about conserving. We need to be developing renewable energy resources. We need to be dealing with climate issues. Um, all kinds of uh, oceans and fisheries and sustainability. And the only way that policy is going to move in directions it needs to move for those things to happen is for everyone to appreciate the roles of scientists and other experts. OK, who have some things to say about those things and can help the policymakers do their jobs. So, um, so it's really important that learning environments, whether they're school environments or other environments, are going to help everybody learn. OK, and school as we know it or otherwise is not going to be able to do it all. Um, and in any event, what school provides will need to be transformed to achieve 21st century competence, okay? That competence that I listed. So now what I want to do is spend some time telling you what I think we know about doing that, okay? These are kind of, for many of you, I'm reminding you of things that we as a field know, okay? Uh, I'm telling you my favorites. There's certainly other things that we know. Um, and I want to, for some of you, you may be hearing for the first time some of the things we know. I think it's really important for us to remember what we know because what I'm going to say later is that we've got to be able to, you know, practice what we preach. Okay, so we've got to know the whole range of things that we're preaching. Um, so one of the things that we know, okay, and there's really, nobody's going to argue with this, is that learning deeply a process of mental model building. Oh, people will argue with that. But if you take that out, learning deeply <laughs> takes sustained and long-term effort and often or usually requires a lot of help. Nobody can argue with that part of it, right? So learning deeply takes sustained and long-term effort and all, all often requires a lot of help. That's like a truism, right? So here's another one. Promoting and sustaining active engagement is somewhere between 50 and 80% of promoting learning. I made up those numbers, 50 to 80%. But, but 
I think that I'm not far off, okay? And when I talk to people, sometimes I say 50% if I don't, because I, I don't want to argue about it. I don't want to be provocative, I say 50%. And if I'm talking to somebody who pretty much already agrees with me, I say 80%, okay? <laughs> and and um, because I think that one of the really big issues with respect to learning is getting people involved in doing it. Okay, and that may be a bigger challenge than making sure this is coming from Kaladner, not NSF. Okay, that may be a bigger challenge than making sure that everybody understands acceleration. Okay, um, you know, if we have some misconceptions about acceleration, it's just not that big a deal. Um, uh, unless you happen to be a physicist, okay? <laughs> Or you happen to be in some position, you know, some livelihood where you really need to know that, okay? But for the rest of us, it's just not that big a deal if we understand acceleration completely or not. But it is a big deal if we're not ready to be engaged to learn, okay? Um, another thing that we know about achieving these objectives, these objectives of making sure everybody is a learner, is that everybody's interests aren't the same and everybody's zone of proximal development isn't the same. So any one size fits all approach that we take is um, not gonna succeed, okay? And that applies to helping teachers learn as well as any other learners, okay? Now I wanna say a little bit more about these first two things, learning deeply and promoting and sustaining active engagement, the things we know about those and some of you uh, will argue with me about mental model building and um, it, I, you just don't have to listen to this if you don't believe it. But um, I, I don't want to get into that, okay? But, um, but I think that mostly we do know and agree that learning is a process of iteratively constructing, revising, and connecting mental models. Okay, models of what we know, models of how to do things. And that becoming fluid at reasoning is an iterative process of composing and debugging sequences of how-tos, okay? And each of those things requires, as I said before, sustained effort over long periods of time, okay? We can only learn on the edges of what we know, okay? We can't, you know, you can't, you can't know this and then be expected to learn something that's way out there. I mean, you can only add to what you know incrementally. And, um, and you know, we need to have goals of learning. We need to want to learn and recognize what we need to learn. And the better we can recognize what we need to learn, the better we'll be able to integrate it with everything else we know. Okay, so we identify needs to learn when um, a mental model or some how-to sequence doesn't work the way we want it to. Okay, either we can't do something we want to do, something turns out differently than we expected, something happens that we weren't expecting, we can't explain why. Um, those are the times when we know, or when any student somewhere knows, okay, that it's time to learn. And uh, doing that learning, that uh, revising and connecting together mental models, okay, requires a great deal of reflection and interpretation, okay? Um, that's needed to recognize the need to learn, to troubleshoot, to revise one's mental models. We know all this, guys. Sometimes people forget it, but we know all this. We know some things about helping learners build mental models. Um, framing first details later, okay? If you start with a minutia and build out from there, people aren't gonna know why they will need to learn it. And their mental models are gonna be quite impoverished because of that, okay? Um, we know that in order to make our mental models better or help people make their mental models better. We can help learners experience the results of their decisions, help them interpret those results, use those to, uh, those results, use those interpretations to debug their reasoning and understanding, and that they need to do it over and over and over again to be it, to learn deeply, repeated deliberative <coughs> practice, 
Okay, and it includes, you know, it requires reflection on, articulation of, debugging of one's reasoning, um, having rec requires having recurring opportunities to try out, troubleshoot, and revise understanding. Um, we know that we can help learners build mental models by leading them to wonder. Um, we can ask them questions sometimes to lead them to wonder. Okay, books, teachers, peers, computer programs can all play this role. Somehow helping learners recognize what they do and don't understand. Helping them identify holes in their mental models. Um, I'm not sure why this next one is there. I'm not going to talk about that. But the, but the second to last one, we know, okay, that it's really important for us to help learners care enough so that they have learning goals. Okay, to help them care enough so that they'll put in the men mental energy to construct and revise their mental models. So that's a really important part of helping learners learn. Okay, and we know that we can help learners connect their mental models to each other by helping them recognize and revisit what they already know and the implications of that on what they're learning. Okay, I think I've actually probably, you know, probably uh, half the audience here, you know, was now recognized in all of this as have, you know, has helped us learn these things. Okay, now the second thing that I said that um, is really important and that we know about promoting learning has to do with engagement. And um, what, how did I say it before? I said promoting and sustaining active engagement is somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of promoting learning. Okay, and uh, we know that if you can promote intrinsic motivation, people have learning goals if they want to learn, then that will promote sustained active engagement. And we know that from a whole lot of different perspectives. Okay, so we know that personal and epistemological, epistemological connections promote engagement. Okay, learners connect when they have prior knowledge to help them connect. If they don't have that knowledge, if it just goes right over them, they're out, okay? We know that learners connect when they're interested. We know that learners connect what they're learning to the real world. I, I'm sorry, con they connect, okay, when what they are learning connects to the real world. I don't think it actually says that there. Okay, when what they're learning connects to the real world as they know it, and when they're helped to make that connection. And with a goal in mind, learners will themselves become curious and want to learn. We know that. We know from the communities of practice literature, okay, that encouraging community encourages engagement. Okay, that people will engage more when they're engaging with a community, could be an affinity group, could be an interest group, it could be a community of practice. And we know some things, actually my research shows, um, how such communities can be created in formal and informal learning environments through engineering early activities to promote shared values and ways of doing and camaraderie, okay, and continued work together sustains that community. We know how to do that, okay. Um, we know that community engagement gives learners opportunities to imagine what they might be, and mentors can help learners align themselves to those imaginations. Okay, so we know some things about how to help learners become interested, remain interested, think about what they might be someday and take on personal goals. Okay, we know about doing those things, that 50 to 80 percent. Okay, um, there's this idea of thick authenticity for maintaining the integrity of the learning environment, maintaining it in such a way that learners will want to continue to engage. Okay, so we know that it needs to be kept real to keep people really engaged. It has to be in the mind of the learners, real to them. 
Okay, they, it has to be personally meaningful to them. Um, it has to be as it would be done in the real world, the kinds of questions and issues that real world people address. Okay, and they have to have opportunities to assess how well they're doing um, along the way. Um, so that means something like uh, having learners solve problems relevant to the world they live in, having available to them the same kinds of tools and resources that professionals would have. Um, a big question or a big challenge that's relevant to them promotes personal connection. And if assessment is embedded and relevant to learners' goals, I'm sorry, assessment ought to be embedded. Um, what they're doing ought to be relevant to their goals, uh, then things will remain meaningful for learners, they'll remain engaged. We also know that if learners have agency, okay, we're not just telling them things, but they get to decide some things that they're doing, they'll decide for themselves to participate. Okay, and that providing scaffolding that promotes success and self-assessment keeps it challenging but not out of reach. So, here are some implications of that, I think, that we ought to keep in mind. I think in learning environments of the future, the ones that we design, the ones that we want other people to design, lessons will be de-emphasized. They won't be the core unit, okay? Instead, challenges will be the core unit. Um, that's not exactly the same as projects. Projects are about doing something. Challenges are about achieving something. Okay, and so I think that challenges will be the key unit. Activities will be done in the context of challenges and lessons in the context of activities. They won't go away. Okay, the, you know, there'll still be things teachers, facilitators, whatever will organize and make happen, but they'll be in the context of activities. And I think that lectures will be for purposes identified by learners as opposed to somebody coming out and saying, okay, today you need to learn, okay? Um, and I think that, you, and I know that you can engineer curricula, if we're talking about school, so that learners identify the things that you want them to identify that they need to learn. Okay, I know that's possible because I have a middle school science curriculum. There are other people in who have worked with me on that, that does that very successfully. Okay, um, but I think that lectures will be for purposes identified for, by learners. They'll often be very short and impromptu um, or recorded and available as needed um, or interactive. Okay, and reading like lectures will be for purposes identified by learners to answer questions they've raised, to provide details on what they've already experienced or conceptualized. It's way easier to read something once you kind of understand something conceptually, get the details out of it, than to read earlier. So classrooms then, going back to school, will be places for addressing challenges together. Um, learning will be purposeful Okay, a focus on learning what's important, the skills and practices for living a life, stewarding a planet, etc. Okay, reading, writing, mathematizing, and content will be learned uh, in the context of addressing challenges together. Um, activities will be quite varied, lectures will be uncommon, reading and lectures will be accompanied by scaffolding, peers will share responsibilities for promoting learning with the teacher and technology. Okay, learning of content and reasoning will be integrated by having learners learn in a context of real and necessary use. And assessment will be purposeful, not simply for accountability, but for purposes of scaffolding and promoting self-recognition and learning. Okay, but I think talking about accountability, it's not gonna go away. Okay, and learning technologies will be used for a whole variety of purposes and integrated into activities in purposeful ways. Okay, um, I don't have a lot of time for examples, but let me just give you one example of a challenge. Okay, in uh, project-based inquiry science, PBIS, there's a very long unit that's a chemistry unit. It's called, how can we improve the air quality in our community? 
or I think that's what it's called. Okay, and they learn chemistry in that context. They uh, walk around their neighborhood to find sources of pollution. They look on the web to find sources of pollution. They build physical models to better understand what air is, what it means for air to be polluted. They read case studies of air pollution in Los Angeles and in the Adirondacks in New York State. They use a physical modeling kit, it's a really neat physical modeling kit, to build molecules, to understand bonding, to, bo to model chemical reactions, to concretely conceptualize the differences between stable and unstable molecules. They build physical models of convection. They view video of several more sophisticated models of convection that also show the effects of conve on convection of landforms and how that keeps pollutants from dispersing. They read about catalytic, con catalytic converters, power plants, many different ways emissions can be lessened. It's really, really neat that reading about scrubbers, learning about scrubbers. You know what scrubbers is, anybody know? That's what keeps all the pollution that comes from power plants from going into the, into the air, okay? Um, and some of those work by chemical reactions, some of those are physical. Um, by looking at that, they learn the differences. They develop and refine explanations where pollution comes from, how it can be mitigated. They examine data from before and after the Clean Air Act was passed. They apply their explanations to what they know about community pollution sources and make suggestions. Um, they're really interested in all this. They're keeping, they're constantly keeping the conversation going, reflecting on what they're learning and how they can use it all the way as they go along. And why would they be interested? Well, they're told a fable early on about the town of Malair um, and um, about the effects of the bad air and it gets them thinking. And it gets them thinking about the things that we want them to think about so that they want to learn about chemistry. Okay, um, in another one I know, um, a group of middle schoolers, this is kitchen science investigators, learns to be scientists in the context of cooking. They're creating and perfecting recipes. They plan and run cooking experiments to learn about the effects of ingredients. So they might um, uh, wanna figure out um, how to make brownies more cakey or more fudgy. Okay, and one group in the class, they'll plan an experiment together. It's not a class. One group among their community will use one egg and another will use two eggs, another three eggs, another four eggs, with the, um, um, the recipe being the same other than that. And then they measure the height of the brownies afterwards and they look at the texture of the brownies and they taste the brownies to get their, you know, to really learn the texture of it. And um, they designed and ran an experiment. Okay, designed and ran an experiment to find all these things. Now let's them make brownies exactly the way they want them to be. For their friends, for their family. Um, and they talk about, you know, how scientists do these things. Um, they also use the computer for all kinds of interesting things. Okay, they keep track of data and analyze data together on the computer. Um, they keep track of the paths to their perfect recipes so they can retell their stories. They publish tips and tricks that include explanations that support their suggestions. They publish publish recipes, like in cooking magazines, and tell the stories behind the recipes. Their technology is used for planning experiments for keeping track of ideas involving recipes, for managing data, for looking up what they need to know, for publishing. Um, one kid becomes a measurement expert, another kid figures out that science is actually about learning new things, another kid makes a whole new group of friends who enjoy science and goes out and you know does things in class that nobody would have expected she would have done. Okay, and why would they be interested? Well, they want to cook for their friends and their family. They want the pats on the back for their food being interesting and good. Um, their imaginations are enticed early on with questions written in a food column asking how to's and they discover that through using science they can answer some of those questions and they can make food for their family and friends that their family and friends are really excited about. Okay, so, and the told you some things about the roles the computer is playing. Okay, I think in all of these, the students are drawing out lessons from what they're doing as they prepare to share the procedures, results, and insights. They're self-assessing in response to questions and comments from peers. 
Um, they're helping each other understand, they're making predictions, they're explaining, they're investigating to answer questions that they've derived. They're comparing and contrasting results of experiments and other investigations, breaking challenges down into pieces and addressing, you know, addressing, um, I'm sorry, addressing uh, those pieces and pulling it back together again, they're reflecting continuously. Um, using learning technologies with purpose in mind, um, all of those different things. So that's learning environments of the future. I'm not sure I said more than that they would be challenge based, but I wanted to give you some idea about what they'll look like. I mean, they're going to have to keep people engaged. Okay, learning technologies are going to solve a lot of different purposes in those future learning environments. Um, they're going to be modeling modeling that can be done on the computer. Okay, modeling to promote learning about systems, the way their pieces are integrated in, with and affect each other. Simulations to understand wh what happens when. Communication for community finding, community interactions, reflection. Communication for connecting experts with learners and learning environments. Video, you go back and you watch yourself. You can self-assessment, video for teacher learning, visual interfaces for access to data, sometimes the big data of scientists social scientists and engineers, analysis and visualization tools, wikis, blogs, embedded assessment, um, 3D um, printers, okay, mobile devices, I didn't talk about mobile devices. Okay, there are lots of different things that technology is going to do. But I think that what's really important to keep in mind in terms of technology is that they're not going to be technological tools that are going to stand alone. Um, we're only going to make a difference in the world if the tools that we're building are integrated with each other in, pack in packages that people can pick up and use as packages. So I think integration is going to be key. Integration of functions, for example, data collection, access, analysis, visualization. Integration across disciplines. Can we use this technology in history as well as science? Integration across time. Um, you know, can we use this or we're, we're, this, this science tools? Can we use them early and use them later? Okay, integration of doing and assessments, integration with activities, integration across activities in and out of school, across teacher and student learning. Apps are going to have to be interoperable with other apps and platforms that integrate will be the rule. So let me tell you about a couple of these. It's getting really late. I'm not going to tell you about too much of this. Um, these are some things that I'm funding through cyber learning. And uh, I'm not mentioning some projects that, are, that belong to some of you in here. I don't want you to feel bad about that. I just had to pick a couple. Um, Geogames is something that's actually not being done by a learning scientist. It's being done by a geographer. And what he's doing is having undergraduates learn to reason about public policy by playing what he calls geogames, to learn geospatial reasoning and the skills and ability to use big data, okay, that's organized geographically to solve problems. So imagine a map, the data is organized, you move around the map to find the data that you need. So geogames are problem solving scenarios across agriculture, transportation, relief, emergency aid, other policy areas that require reasoning about the effects of nature and the effects of policy on geographically contiguous spaces. So the online maps give access to GIS data, remote sensing data, socioeconomic data, agricultural data, other kinds of data, and learners play roles in different geographic areas and interact to explore how what's done and what happens in one area affects other areas. So you might have farmers in different places in India interacting with each other um, based on the policies that are in place and what happens, you know, in response to things and um, in response to those policies and how what happens in one place propagates to other places. And they play roles and they see that happening and they're accessing the data about those places all along the way to see that happening. Um, the class time is for, they play the games uh, for homework, and class time is for discussion, reflection, identifying what needs to be learned, and the occasional lecture, okay? And there's integration here, integration of formal and informal activities, 
learning in the context of challenges, progression of challenges, integration of doing and reflecting, engagement through community and thick authenticity. Okay, um, challenges, research challenges are in the design of the interface, the integration of activities on and offline, and the promotion of geospatial thinking and complex problem solving. Okay, um, um, and I already said that about integration. Another really neat project also does not include learning scientists, by the way. Um, contextualized English language learning done at Springfield Community College in Massachusetts. Refugees and immigrants. Community colleges have a lot of refugees and immigrants in their English language learning classes. They have many fewer of those people in their regular classes. Why is that? It's because those people have jobs and families and live far away and simply don't have time to engage a lot in language learning. So uh, what these guys are doing is building a 3D virtual campus community. Okay, and um, then integrating the language learning in class with the language learning in that 3D interactive community. Their students don't have a lot of opportunity to learn to speak English. They don't, they're not in jobs where they speak English or have English speakers around. But what they can do on their own time is become part of this virtual campus community, okay? Um, interacting about things that are important with respect to being a student. Um, now, there's some challenges in making this work because, you know, who's going to be part of this community in the middle of the night? But, um, you know, there are students who are up in the middle of the night and they might be part of this community. So making the virtual campus work has scaffolding challenges and it has social challenges. The big challenges aren't in the technology itself, but in making those technology work. So scaffolding that allows learners not to be embarrassed by their accents, their poor grammar, and their vocabulary, and incentives for the English-speaking population to participate online. The integration here is of in-class and out-of-class activities and getting community involved in promoting learning of others in the community. Um, here's one where some of the people involved might be out there in the audience. I haven't seen those people yet. Okay, a project in family learning. The idea here is to promote families learning about energy together through interactions around an instrumented thermostat and a platform with simulation resource access and uh, family energy use data, okay, to learn about energy and resource use. So, you know, they need to regulate the temperature in the house. They need to keep the expenses down. Um, and uh, that promotes family discussion. In fact, that promotes family fights in many families, okay? And um, they, I mean, you're laughing, but y you know it's true, right? So um, the challenge is to find what resources, simulations, and data visualizations will keep the family engaged over time in discussing and learning more about the science of energy and issues of energy resources. Okay, so where's the integration here into the life of the family? That's a big challenge. Um, it has to happen in a way that integrates promoting question answering, question asking, promoting exploration, investigating to answer the questions, promoting self-assessment, um, that allows family members to know what they understand and what they need to understand better. I mean, how do you get these people who are fighting about, you know, turning the, the thermostat up and down to actually want to learn about energy? Big challenge. This is the challenge these guys have taken on. Okay. And two more that I want to tell you about are actually integrative, integrative um, efforts, uh, also both done by, um, by learning scientists who might be here. Okay, um, both of them focus on learning how to support authentic scientific inquiry in a way that promotes deep scientific inquiry. That's, sorry, that's not a good sentence. That conveys an accurate understanding of the practices of scientists and helps students become data scientists. Okay, both are integration initiatives. They focus on integrating sets of learner appropriate scientific tools for student scientists. Okay, and on integrating the use of those platforms, 
okay, those platforms of tools into the everyday activities of science classrooms. Not just something that you take out once in a while, but really making them part of the activity of the classrooms. Dorsey and company focus on the pedagogical practices for integrating use of the, such a platform into classroom activities without overwhelming students, okay, and without overwhelming teachers with the rich set of possibilities, okay, and they focus on the technological needs in integrating these multiple tools. And, um, you know, the scaffolding that needs to be there so that you can actually get teachers and students to take on using these complex platforms that are actually written for students to use, okay. Martin et al. focus on integrating data collection devices into such a setup and creating a sense of community across classrooms that will help students see themselves as part of a community of student scientists. They're not just themselves in their classroom and it's a weird classroom, but interacting with students in classrooms in other places where kids are doing the same things, okay, and seeing themselves as communities of learners okay, um, that go across classrooms, okay, the students seeing themselves that way and the teachers seeing themselves that way so that they can facilitate that kind of learning, okay. Um, none of them are full integrations, okay, um, but each is a start and I think that none of them assume school as it is today. Um, and I also think that soon no technologies will be broadly adopted in schools unless they incorporate assessment possibilities. Some combination of feedback to learners, feedback to teachers, and accountability information. And I can't tell you, you know, that either one of these does that right now. But I can tell you that uh, I told them, you know, at, at talking as an NSF person, I told them they have to at least think about it. Okay, I can tell you that I did that. So, uh, I want to get to the third part of my talk now, okay? How can we have influence? How can we take the things we know, the really neat things we're doing, um, out into the world and really make a difference? And number one, I think, is we need to practice what we preach. If we believe all these things about promoting learning, and I'm not practicing what I preach, I'm boring all of you right now, okay? I'm sorry. I don't know any other way to do it, and maybe you don't know any other way to do it either, but we're gonna have to find better ways, okay? Practice what we preach. If we believe all these things about promoting learning, then we need to make sure our own classes, and certainly for those of you who are in education schools, I've never been in an education school, um, we have to make sure that the curriculum, curricula of those who will be teachers are exemplars of good practice. Okay, those people who are going to be teachers have to experience learning in these ways that we know promote learning. We have to make sure the products we develop and the conditions for investigations um, match what we know. Okay, so any investigations we're doing, if we put people in front of something for an hour and then look for transfer, guys, we already know that doesn't happen. Okay, it's never going to happen. There's no surprises there. Okay, deep learning requires sustained long-term engagement. We got to make sure our products do that. We got, or our products facilitate that, encourage that, and we got to make sure the investigations we do Okay, take that into account. We need to build on each other's work. Okay, it's not okay not to use the work of others. Okay, we need to add, uh, we need to build on each other's work. It can't be all about our own small projects. It can't be all about our own favorite ideas. Okay, um, our egos need to be set aside and we need to use what comes from other labs. Okay, and what we're doing. And we need to add integration, I think, to our intellectual agenda. Not just, again, not just working on our own small thing, I've got this visualization tool that I'm doing, you know, and I've got this simulation thing, and I've got this modeling one. I mean, we gotta think about integration, not just the pieces. There are all kinds of 
intellectual challenges in integration. There are all kinds of research challenges, you know, in terms of what it means to learn in a environment where we've got integrated capabilities available for learners. Okay, um, so our ideas taken together can accomplish a lot more than any of the ideas that come from one person or one lab. Okay, and I know how hard it is for egos to be set aside for the greater good. Okay, I mean, you know, my comment about we had to do that in PBIS was, you know, but of course I knew it when in developing my middle school curriculum, but of course I knew that everything I was doing, was, I wanted to do was right. Okay, so I do know it's hard. <laughs> um, you didn't laugh at that. Okay. Um, it means I've really been boring you. Okay. I think we have to add to our agenda. Okay. Moving research into practice needs to be added to our community agenda. There are few people doing it. Okay. Um, and that's really good. And I think more people have to do it. Okay. This means, okay, it may mean we do it ourselves. And it may mean that we find that we, that there's some set of us who become interpreters and integrators. Those people who take the best of our ideas from across everything that we're doing, okay, and package it into products, okay, integrated platforms and packages, okay. PBIS has foundations in learning by design, has foundations in project-based science. The ideas from both were needed for it to succeed. It's way better than any of us could have done by ourselves. And the products of our research, our curriculum units were needed to succeed. But the truth is that the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. And there's no part of that integrated whole Okay, those curriculum units that went into it, there's no part of that integrated whole that did not escape really significant refinements and sometimes total redefinition. Okay? It had to happen to make a whole thing. Okay? It had to happen to make it coherent. So I think we need to welcome that kind of integration. We need to figure out how we as researchers can work with people who are doing that integration to make sure that the integrity of the original ideas remain. And I will argue that the integrity of both learning by design and project-based science remain in PBIS. Okay, we worked really hard to make sure that happened. Okay, um, an integrator will know how to make the most of technology, will integrate in new interface technologies, will work towards making things work for teachers. I know it's not all about technology. We'll work, work towards making things work for teachers. Uh, you know, the integrator will know how to bring the real world into it in ways that we try to do, but we don't really know, okay? Um, we don't have to take our research to practice by ourselves, but we have to be willing to hand over our products. Not just hand them over, hand them over and to be available to help. And yes, there will be a lot of going like this and a lot of yelling and screaming and no, you can't do that with my product and in the end saying, okay, I guess we have to do some of that. But I, I think we need to do it. Um, and that's going to require distinguishing between the principles in, our pro in the products of our research and the products themselves. Okay, you know, my vehicles in motion unit okay, was not as important as the ideas that came from learning by design, okay? And vehicles in motion is real different now than it was when it came from Georgia Tech, okay? But the principles are intact, okay? Um, maybe some of our students need to become interpreters and integrators, okay? Or maybe there are those people out there already and we have to help them learn what we know. Um, some of the taking things into practice will be taking curriculum into practice. And I think we need to think about curriculum always having variety in them, okay? Not the same thing over and over and over again. Need to think about them being integrated over time. So you might have physical science, you know, over elementary to middle school to high school. How do they, how do they build on each other? We gotta think that big, okay? Um, think 
curriculum integration with technology, but not that technology is going to take the place of doing things in the physical world. People need to have real things in their hands too to understand things. They have to have real physical experiences. Um, make sure you think about agency, sustained engagement, thick authenticity. Don't make the curriculum that you're doing old school like. Okay, standards tell us what to aim for. They don't tell us how to get there and exactly what to do. Um, we need to remember that learning requires sustained engagement over significant time periods. You can't sell out on this. It's not okay. Okay, think about what's most important with respect to learning and don't compromise on those things. Okay, and look, this learning requires sustained engagement. You know, that's the first thing everybody's going to push for out in the real world. Okay, they're going to say, you can only have two weekly units. You can't do anything bigger than that. You know, don't give in. Don't give in. With respect to taking technology into practice, um, teachers are going to not need to know how to use it. And I think that uh, you know, many of us have had the experience of building technology and it's not used. Why? Sometimes it's not used because it's not integrated into curriculum and it's too hard for teachers to do that. They, they weren't educated to do that. Okay? So integrating uh, the technology into good published curriculum and curriculum units is going to be an important thing in taking technology into practice. Like I said before, I think we've got to integrate assessment into whatever else it is we're doing. Um, t with feedback to learners and teachers, with accommodations for accountability, because it's going to be asked for. Um, we've got to remember that learning often happens in the interactions between community members, between uses of technology. We're going to have to make that part of the design of the technology part of the packaging of its use, part of the teacher materials in how you use this stuff and the teacher education. Um, I think that we've got to think mobile. Okay, not everything has to go on a tablet, but let's not forget the affordances of mobile technology. Okay, when I got my guy, when I got my iPad two years ago, I got so excited. I'm still really excited about that. Um, there are all kinds of affordances that this thing that's, you know, this big and you carry it around with you has that nothing else has, okay? And I think, as I said before, we've got to think integration and not just individual pieces. Um, I think we need to spend more time and effort evaluating the products of integration and need to make sure that evaluation, that evaluation happens in ways that show under what circumstances these products are effective. Okay, large controlled random trials only after we know why and under what circumstances the technology works effectively. Okay, you got to do the implementation research first. Okay, we need to make sure we don't sabotage those trials. We got to make sure they're set up for success, for example, with appropriate teacher professional development. Okay, with smaller trials first to show why and under what circumstances an innovation works. I mean, there's a lot of jumping to doing, um, you know, randomized controlled trials early. I know that IES pushes for that. That's an organization in, in, in the United States. But I think, you know, it's a bad idea. Okay, I think we got to figure out, we got, we got to do it in ways that show under what circumstances the things, the products we're creating work. Otherwise, it's all going to be backlash, okay? It's, they're not going to work in other ways. Um, there's a lot in taking research to practice that's hard. I think our job, I mean, I didn't talk about all the things that are hard. There's a lot that's hard. I think our job is to help the public and policymakers have imagination. Getting our products out there to show what can work, um, out there in ways that make it easy for teachers to see how to use them, modeling for future teachers what's possible, showing the circumstances, and under, uh, circumstances under which our products and approaches work, and what makes a difference in their context of use. And finally, gotta remember to work on what's important. Begin with a challenge in mind, with national or international importance, focus on the transformational part of it, Make sure you're forward-looking, 
Not everything needs to be about school, by the way. Don't, don't do everything about school, okay? Uh, no, certainly there's no need to buy into what school is today, okay? Um, your research outside of school might make school happen in a different way later on, okay? Um, if you're not drawing from at least three literatures, and I pull that number out of the air, but I would say if you're not drawing from at least three literatures, what you're doing isn't important enough. I mean, there's nothing that's important enough that, you know, one literature answers all of it. Okay, so you might need to pull from the identity literature and the cognitive literatures and the engagement literatures. Okay, you might need to pull from science, you know, from science education. Okay, from literacy at the same time. Um, you got it, you got to do all of it. Okay, really solving the problems requires knowing, you know, taking what is known across lots of different fields. If you're not drawing from what's known outside your lab, it's not important enough. Okay? Um, and really transformational work requires really careful exploration before controlled experiments or even quasi-experiments. Don't jump to comparisons too soon. Okay, focus on understanding affordances and challenges to effective use first, but don't stop there. Okay, keep going, bring your innovations to fruition. That's what I have to say. Um, thank you very much, uh, Janet. I, I Thank God we have recorded this session because there were lots of ideas and challenges on the slides. Um, before we go into a, a, we have still some time for a short question and, and, and maybe answer uh, session. Uh, just to give you an update on the temperature issue, uh, Michael and I in the meantime tried to find out how to increase the temperature in this room. And uh, the response was we are on it and will take up to was it three to four hours to make it to the system? Uh, we probably won't be here long. It did get, it did get warmer while I was speaking. Yeah, yeah, you, but yeah. you got it. The, um, I think the uh, uh, message for tomorrow morning and the re all other uh, keynotes will be in the morning is to uh, bring your warm clothes this year. <laughs> It's the same as Australia and a country that has only six to eight weeks of cold weather a year. They don't really build things for it. Uh, I'm saying this is somebody from Northern Europe. Okay, now um, uh, questions or so. I'm happy to share the microphone uh, for that. Hi, Janet. Hi. Uh, so you always ask uh, really tough questions, uh, and so I thought I'd continue oh, the tradition and ask okay. a really tough question. Um, the idea of bringing our theory into practice and that we need to do that is, I think, a really controversial one, because I'd like to just poll the audience. How many here are in the public sector? Uh, and in other words, working at a, a, a school, um, a, a research institution, and something like that, or for a government agency, how many people? Okay, um, how many people are in the private sector? Uh, a few. A few. So, in many, many research areas, there are these things called uh, private companies, which take the theory and put it into practice. And I feel and like that's not happening that. as much. Yeah. And um, do we ignore the private sector? Well, what do we do with that? Is there a way to stimulate that? Or do we just say abandon it and create our Well, own? that's what this is about. Okay, I think we have to add to our agenda taking research into practice. Okay, and do you, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, felt like the mic is different. We need to add that to our agenda. And I think that, um, yeah, that's going to require creating some organizations. Do I need that? It's not mine. No, that's going to be, require creating more organizations that do that, whether they're nonprofits or whether they're companies, um, you know, that make a profit, um, pri private-public partnerships. Um, I don't know. 
I mean, it's one of the things I have not had time to do at NSF, but I'm, I'll be working in that area to figure out some of the things we need to do. But absolutely, and there are all kinds of challenges with that, and I did not talk about those challenges, but um, absolutely we need to do it. It wasn't that hard a question. <laughs> so we are looking for a harder question? Yeah, a harder question. Because Jeff is disappointed that he didn't get to ask me a really, really hard question. Hi, Janet. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. In one of your slides, uh, you had something that said um, learning will be purposeful um, about things that are important. I think it was roughly in the middle. Yeah. And I couldn't uh, completely read the paragraph, but you had a few interesting things, and I'd like you to go more in depth. You mentioned about skills and attitudes to live a happy life, uh, well being, health. <laughs> Okay, so okay, so you know, some of that goes back to Dewey, right? So I, I don't know a whole lot about Dewey, but Dewey talked about education being, I know I should know a lot more, but, uh, but Dewey talked about, you know, education being integrated with life, right? That's one of the things that he talked about, and education isn't just you go and you memorize a bunch of things, it's integrated with life, and that's really what I mean here. Okay, learning is purposeful means that whoever the learners are, okay, they, they have a reason that they want to learn whatever it is that they're learning. And every single thing they do, okay, has a purpose that goes along with some goals. You know, some of those purposes, some of those purposes might be, and I, in this, oh, I didn't talk about one of my other units. Um, I, I had it on here and I skipped it. We've got a unit about um, uh, genetics, okay? And in this unit, the kids are um, coming up, with, it's a PBIS unit. The kids are coming up with a, de designing a new breed of rice, okay, that will grow with, uh, in drought conditions, I mean, not exactly drought conditions, but with less water, okay, and has more new, more nutrients in it than, you know, anything we have now. It'll have both of those. And um, in the course of doing that, they've got to learn a whole lot about inheritance. And uh, they've got to get pretty fluid at doing these things that Punnett squares do for us, right? And that could be really boring, okay? But they, have reason to want to learn about doing this kind of genetic prediction. And so they practice with Punnett squares over and over again, and they don't complain. It's with a purpose, okay? So learning with a purpose doesn't mean that you're never gonna do, you're never gonna practice, right? What it means is that when people are involved and, you know, people have a reason to do something, they'll engage better, okay, at doing it. Now, I, I said this thing about a focus on, and I didn't say all of this, but a focus on learning what's important. I think that, um, that, that hope, I hope, okay, and we can have an influence on this, okay, I hope that what's gonna be learned in school is not just gonna be facts, okay? It's not just all gonna be inert but it's gonna be the set of things that we, that whoever agrees is important to learn for people to be able to live productive lives, you know, in, and participate as citizens, okay? What's that mean? I mean, it means some things about stewarding a planet, it means some things about health and well-being. it means some things about jo joining a workforce, about being able to, you know, being able to make, being, knowing how to solve problems, make informed decisions, when to trust evidence. Um, it means all of those things, okay? I'm saying that I think that in the, in the future, I'm hoping that in the future, um, learning will be about those things, okay? And that learning of content and learning of reasoning skills is gonna happen in those contexts, right? It's gonna happen, it's gonna happen in those contexts, but not be the be all and end all. Okay, so 
Okay, we can have one more burning question. Two more? People <laughs> raise their hand if there are three more? Oh, there's got to be another question. Come on. There's one in the back. Keith. No, not a burning question. Is the learning sciences singular or plural? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's plural. It's learning sciences is plural. <laughs> learning science means learning the content of science, right? Learning how scientists do things, but learning... Learning sciences is a interdisciplinary You would not say that learning sciences that's right. Learning sciences. Oh, so it's <laughs> absolutely. Learning sciences is an interdisciplinary field. Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> importance of integration, especially integration across the disciplines, you know, curriculum, technology, assessment. But as we think about issues, I think learning sciences tend to be do the more fundamental things. Well, the integrating, thing, I think it's uh, more of the strengths of the people who are working on uh, curriculum development and uh, evaluation and assessment. So it's almost, you know, uh, pointing us to uh, do the work of uh, other field, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure, I try to imagine what's the role of a uh, learning scientist in the whole integration, how you... I don't think it's doing the work of other fields. In fact, you know, my biggest accomplishment as a learning scientist is a three-year middle school curriculum. Okay, I became a curriculum, I actually became, went into the curriculum business because um, I wanted to go into the learning technologies business, help people learn from experiences that they were having in, um, you know, in science class. And th there wasn't any science curriculum that was worth building software for. So I went into the curriculum business. But, I, you know, that's my biggest accomplishment as a learning scientist, is learning how to take what we know about learning and using that to design, um, integrating that, right? Using that to design an approach, um, principles for an approach, okay? That would promote learning in a way that deals with all of those engagement issues, okay? And deals with the cognitive issues of mental model building at the same time. I mean, curriculum developers don't do that work, okay? There's nobody among curriculum developers, you know, the people who call themselves curriculum developers, who know how to do that. They don't know the things we know, okay? The way textbooks are written, you got two-page spreads. I, I know this because my publishers have told me, right? You got two-page spreads. We're going to have two pages about inheritance, and we're going to have two pages about dominant something or other, you know? And they send it out for somebody to write. That's not curriculum development, right? And curriculum development otherwise has to do with scope and sequence, okay? I learned that from my collaborators, okay? It has to do with scope and sequence. But scope and sequence isn't what it's about either, okay? What it's really about and what we get to, you know, what we know and can help people with, and can create products around, okay, is what we know about the sequencing of activities, okay, the sequencing of activities that will promote engagement and promote learning. And there's nothing demeaning about getting into that, and there's nothing that, you know, nothing that goes beyond being a learning scientist. Okay, now I'm not saying everybody needs to do that, I'm saying there are a set of us who love to do that, okay? I'm one of them. There are a set of us who love to do that, and I hope there will be more of those people, and I hope that some of those people will start companies and, you know, get real products out there. 
okay? And, uh, or be the ones who we'll work with. Now, what will our role be? What will your role be? Because I already said I love doing the integration. What will your role be? Okay, your role will be in um, being part of a group of people, okay, who, um, who together have some answers and how to design, how to do that design, okay, and who advise the, uh, advise the integrators, advise those people who are creating, who are creating the products, okay, about how to do it. And your particular role, okay, you, okay, will be to make sure that the sequencing is such, okay, that people's, that kids' ideas, okay, are always made into concrete, concrete things, objects, okay, that can be reasoned around. Okay, and that can change over time. Um, he works in knowledge building. That can be changed over time. Okay, and there's a history of how that change happens. And there are facilities and times. There are times during the curriculum when you think about, um, what's it called? Um, when you pull things together, rising above. Okay, and, and you will be adamant about those principles being in there because you know, okay, that kids are not going to be main engaged and that learning is not going to happen unless that's happening. Okay, that's your role. Thank you. On that note, let's give Jenny a hand. I think it became clear that your passion is not only with cooking. And uh, on that note, also a little thank you from from our side.